give it one more try. It usually saves, saves that particular setting. Like right now it's working, but it should have saved that setting too. All right. So getting back to Office Suites, um, we talked about you know the various types of software. We talked about spreadsheets. I showed you guys you know, what you can do. You know, very simple things that you can do with a spreadsheet. You can do a lot more than that. I actually planned the uh, not the curriculum but the syllabus using a spreadsheet, so I can count the number of classes. Uh, I can count the, the number of hours that I need to teach, and then I can allocate you know how much time in each class to allocate to each topic. But I don't, I don't really follow my own syllabus, so <laughs> <laughs> in terms of the time schedule. Um, but you can do a lot of fancy stuff with a spreadsheet. You'll be amazed. You know, take, if you take one or two classes in a spreadsheet class and just look through the help you know, of a spreadsheet you know, program, you'll be surprised you know, how much flexibility you have when it comes to you know, doing all sorts of different calculations using a spreadsheet. Uh, it will be very helpful in your engineering classes, your math classes, and also your science classes because you can uh, use it to, you know, one, record all the data, two, plot the data, and three, to analyze the data. You know, all the statistical functions are built in if you want to find out what is the mean standard deviation, linear regression, and stuff like that. And the best part of it compared to your calculator is you have a much bigger screen. And you can backtrack everything too, because you know all your calculations are shown, and you can save the files as many times as you want under different file name. So I think spreadsheets will be particularly helpful to people who are you know in this class, because most of you are in this class because either you are in computer science or your major has to use computers for a lot of you know the work that you have to do. <coughs> So are there any questions about um, the major types of software? We haven't really finished yet. Finished this yet. We talked about word processing. We talked about spreadsheets. I kind of talked about database. Uh, we have not talked about presentation yet. So this is our last topic with Office Suites before we move on to the next type of software. Any questions up to this point? No questions? How much of this? Of these, can we do online without using an installed program? Pretty much all. I would say database is the only one that's still kind of questionable. You know, I have not found a good you know, web-based database front end. Um, back ends, you know, they're all you know on the web, you know, in the cloud anyway. But the front end, you know, I have not really seen any really good design that is us usable from my perspective. Um, Google now has forms. You can use Google Docs to make forms. So I'm, I think that's the first step to implement a database front end. <coughs> there, there's no more Google Docs though, right? It's all Drive. Drive. Drive you know? I think some accounts will still say it as a Google Docs. I they just bump mine over. Oh, okay. Last week. So you so they they're forcing everybody to switch over to Docs yeah, to, to a Drive. They're okay. all like all of your doc, uh, Google Docs will now be in Google Drive. It's the same thing, you yeah. know. Yeah. Just a different way of presenting it. Now we are only down to presentations, you know, presentation software. Can anyone tell me what you can do with a presentation software out of an office suite? Slides. Slides. Sorry, go ahead. Make a presentation. Make a presentation, very good. Um, you can actually do a lot more than just making a presentation, like a presentation where I'm here and I click the screen. Um, you can make the slideshow fully automated. You can even make it interactive. In other words, you can make multiple choice questions with a presentation software. Depending on what the user clicks, you know, it will give it will do different things. It can be very fairly complicated. Um, most people don't use those advanced features. You know, they just use it as a slideshow mechanism. I personally do not like to use a presentation software because it relies on installed software on a computer in order to replay the content of the presentation. There are people now moving on to web-based presentation software, and I think one is called Prezi. Prezi.com, I think. There you go. Uh, this is an online resource, kind of like Google Documents, uh, but this one is specialized in making presentations. And they make very interesting animations, you know, you know, switches between screens. Let me see if I can find any sample ones. Do you think it's better than PowerPoint? 
Um, it's different. I wouldn't say it's better, but it's 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 very innovative the way the way they do it. Um, let me see if I can find a the magical theory of rel okay. These are all demonstrations for, uh, done by other people. So we'll go ahead and take a, take a look at one. I, have to, I still have to click it. But you can see how it pans and rotates. So it's almost like the entire presentation is on one big sheet of paper, and it's just rotating and panning to see the various parts of that big sheet of paper. And it's a lot more dynamic, I think, compared to uh, PowerPoint presentations. I do not think PowerPoint presentations can do anything you know, like this. Something like this on Flash. A Flash? Yeah. Yeah, but that also requires the installation of Flash, you know, which is this is a, this is I think all based on JavaScript, so it should run in all platforms. Okay. Any questions about Prezi? You can get a free account too. I mean, you need an account in order to make your presentation uh, using Prezi, and I think that you know, just this you know part here I think is kind of fun because. The equation is really small down here, and by zooming in, the the equal symbol on top of the equal symbol is you know this little you know slide here, and then you can zoom back out into the equation, and then rotate the whole thing you know back to some other parts of the big sheet of paper. So I think it is very dynamic, um, depending on what kind of presentation you need to make. You, this may be too much, okay? This may be too unconventional, um, but depending on what you, what is your target audience, this may be more effective too because it is a lot more dynamic, and your audience may feel, oh, okay, you know, I can stay awake, you know, throughout the entire presentation, whereas PowerPoint presentations tend to be a little bit drier. Okay. Any quest any questions about Prezi? How many people have already started to use Prezi for your presentations? No one. How many people knew of Prezi before the class? Okay. You just haven't had a need to use it. Okay. <laughs> well, this class has a presentation at the very end, so I think this would be a good resource to use for the presentation at the end of this class. I think you're right about it being Java because it says iPad friendly down there in the corner. Yep. iPad friendly. Tolerant. <laughs> free open source. I do not know whether it is actually open sourced or not. That part I do not well, know. It has a button that says pricing right next to sign up, so maybe it's not completely free. Um, I think you, no. you can use public, you can use core features, 100 megabytes of storage space, and that doesn't cost you anything. You do have to register, and then if you pay five, basically five bucks a month, uh, you get 500 megabytes, half a gig of storage space, you can make your presentations private, so you don't have to share that with the world. You can have your own logo and premium support. If you pay $13 a month, you get more storage, two gigabytes. Um, and the addition to that one would be to use Prezi Desktop, so now you can, off, you can use it offline. But that's basically the whole point is to use it online, so I can use it you know, and edit my presentations anywhere I go. So I think you know you can at least start with you know the um, the free accounts you know and see whether it works out for you. You can use it free for thirty days for the presentation this class. <laughs> then you're like you know what I don't want to pay this money. Well, I think for this class, I think the free accounts would be fine. I mean, I really don't think that we'll spend that much time to do any. Thing too fancy in this class. One looks like, looks like they're more for businesses. Yeah. Use your right. And stuff like <clears throat> that. Yep. And also to be the ability to edit offline. You know, that's basically for business people too. Yeah. All right. So that's basically a presentation. You know, when you look at the slides here, I can barely read because of the resolution. 
there is this part says themes because you can select a theme for your entire presentation that controls the background color, the pattern, the bitmap, the font, the color of the font, is stuff like that. Uh, special notes, there's graphics, transitions, and bulleted lists. Fantastic. Now there's only one warning about using present presentation software. Um, some people can spend weeks and months on a single presentation because there's no end to how much you can do to the, especially the slide transitions. You can make it fancy, you can make it really interesting, but I think a lot of people spend way too much time on that part, and so the presentation, you know, the preparation of, it, of the presentation takes longer than uh, expected. Any questions about Office Suite software? No questions? So I think everything is going on the web, you know, going to the cloud. Um, so much of this, you know, will be changed by the next, by the time this, the next edition of the textbook comes out, I think a lot of this stuff will be obsolete already. Um, things are really moving in a fast pace these days. <coughs> Actually, Microsoft is doing that now. Office 360 is all cloud based. Yep. Mm -hmm. We talked about uh, Office 360 last time. Um, I was asking people whether they can compare Google Documents with uh, Office 360. And then the, I think the general comment or feedback was uh, 360 had more features because it's still based on Office, Microsoft Office, um, but it doesn't have the same subscription base as uh, Google Documents. Okay. Spreadsheets. A lot of this stuff, especially spreadsheet, most people don't, most people don't even know what a spreadsheet is before this class. Um, but once you know what a spreadsheet is, you know the application of a spreadsheet is, you know, that's a lot of application. You can do use it to do a lot. Right. Installing software and upgrades. Um, when was the last time your system just gives you a prompt and say? It's time to update this Adobe product. It's time to update your Java, you know, engine. It's time to update Windows. Other reason. This morning. Yeah, every day, almost. Okay, it's well, almost every right day. Now. Depending on how much software you install in the system, you know, it can be more than once a day. Okay. Hmm? Java likes to update like every hour. That's <laughs> because there's like security vulnerabilities found every. That inspires a lot of confidence, right? <laughs> yeah, you're selling a product that needs that many updates. Yeah, that day. There's always a job Should you update every time the door for updates? For Java? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, for whatever. Because For Windows, definitely. You know, if Microsoft says, you know, but when Microsoft uh, suggests an up upgrade or update in this case, um, it will categorize and say, you know, how many are critical, critical and how many are optional. You should definitely do the critical because they usually plug some kind of security holes in the system. And because you know Windows is your operating system, you know whatever you fix applies to your know, system wide. It's not just one application. With uh, Acrobat Reader, let's say it has a security hole, as long as you don't download and open new PDFs, you, for the most part you'll be safe. But if your operating system, like Windows Seven itself, you know has a security hole then it doesn't matter what you do. You can just you know, do nothing, let your computer connect to the internet and do nothing. If the security hole allows a worm to go through, then your system can still be compromised. So in the case of systems, you know, system updates, I would do it you know, right away. In terms of applications, sometimes you can wait a little bit. Like you know, if you have a Microsoft Office update, um, maybe you can wait as long as you don't try to open new documents you know, before you, upgrade, you know, update the system. But a lot of the updates have to do with uh, either bug fixes, in other words, you know, you don't want the program to crash, or a security you know, related type of bug, which is even more important. Um, the other types of updates you should do right away would be uh, Windows Defender. You know, when you, when Windows Defender says, you know, I need to update my database, you know, to, so that it, up, it understands more about malware, that should be updated as well. If you can set it up to be automatic, you should just you know, let it up, update itself. 
How many people use uh, something other than Windows Defender for virus checking? So a lot of people do. What do you guys use? Trend Micro. Sorry? Trend Micro. Trend Micro. AVG. First view. Microsoft Security Essentials. Malwarebytes. Isn't that the same as Windows Defender? I don't know. It, it is. is. It's the upgraded version. Okay. Oh. I don't know. Yeah, it's free to How many people do not have any sort of protection? <laughs> <laughs> Do you run it inside a virtual machine or? No? <laughs> Some people, now this is back when you know, XP was the uh, standard operating system, um, but the average time of an XP system getting compromised as soon as you plug it onto the uh, internet was about three minutes. In other words, you install a stock version of Windows XP on a regular computer you connect it to your ISP with no firewall sitting in between, in three minutes, the computer will be compromised. <laughs> oh my God. Without you doing anything. <laughs> Without any user doing anything, the system will be compromised in three minutes. Not, enough, not even enough time to download all the updates and, uh, and upgrade the system. <laughs> it will take about 15 minutes to ha maybe half an hour to download and install SP1 and then SP2, Surface Pack 1, Surface Pack 2. So, so that's, a, that's a big problem because you, know, you don't even have enough time to upgrade your system. Okay, installing software, you know, the, the textbook separated it into, once again, there are different categories based on what type of application you're installing, like mobile applications, web applications, portable software, and local applications. For the most part, people, you know, even today, there are many people who mostly have local applications. Local applications are basically stuff that you install on your hard drive. So if your computer goes bad or if you crash your hard drive, the purple stuff will be all gone. I mean, there's no, because it's, it's only stored in your system. Mobile applications are a little bit different because depending on, you know, with Android, which reminds me to turn off my phone or the ringer, with Android, um, it, you know, once I install applications, it remembers what applications I have installed on this particular device. So the next time I get another device, I can actually easily reinstall exactly the same software on the next device. So that's pretty handy. Web applications do not usually require any installations because it is actually running in the serve on the server side, so there's nothing you have to install on the local side. You just have to remember your username and your password, and that's about it. Any questions? Any questions about this stuff? What about portable apps or portable software down here? That's an interesting concept. I really like that concept. It's kind of like a hybrid of you know, some other things. I'll show you where you can find the portable apps. Portableapps.com. And have I shown you guys this already or not? No? Okay. Now this is really interesting because it combines you know, several concepts that we have talked about. Uh, for one, everything here is open sourced. In other words, they're all free. Okay, you don't have to pay a dime to download and install this kind of software. You can make copies of that. You can you know, make copies for your friends. It doesn't matter. Um, I'll go ahead and go take a look at a particular app. And you will think, yeah, but why, why do I want to do it this way instead of some other ways? So if I look under the internet uh, category, you will see you know, a whole list of browsers. We have Google Chrome, and then we have um, Firefox, Opera, and ZMonkey. Those are the really popular browsers. Um, so why do I want to install a browser in a portable way instead of just you know, installing, installing it on a hard drive? Well, when you install a portable application, the application is, you can install it on a thumb drive. So you just go buy a 16-gig you know, thumb drive or an SD card with an SD card reader, and you can install the application on your SD card. That means you can take that same SD card and go to a different system, put it in, and you have your application with you all the time. Okay? So that's flexibility, because now with some of the more exotic software, or where you work, they do not allow you to install any software, 
this is an easy way to keep running the software that you want to run without installing it on the hard drive. But the actual, the, the biggest advantage of doing it this way is how many people like to keep your bookmarks and your settings, okay? Now with Google Chrome, you can actually sync you know, using the cloud, okay? So no matter where you go, once you, once you log in, you can sync it. Uh, but when you sync it, that also means your bookmarks, your settings, your, you know, all your preferences will be also stored on the local hard drive. Your administrator will be able to come in and check, you know, what is your where where your bookmarks are pointing. To. Um, if you install it as a portable application, everything is stored on your SD card. Your bookmarks on your SD card. The application itself on your SD card. The cache on your SD card. Your settings on your SD card, your cookies on your SD card. So that means you, know, you can unplug it on one computer, plug it into the next computer, and everything stays with the SD card. So it's pretty, you use, you know, pretty useful that way, you know, um, because you, know, you can keep everything with you. Yep. Like, doesn't uh, portable programs run for, like, faster? No, they run slower, actually. Unfortunately, they usually run slower because of the device itself. Everything else being the same, they should run a little bit faster because they're linked statically. They don't use DLLs. Nice. Yep. Because I, when I did portable program, I used to use Adobe Acrobat 10. When I did portable, it was working actually a lot faster than the CD. Really? Of the program. Because I guess for me, probably because of the connector, I was using a USB 3.0. So mm -hmm. probably because it reads faster and writes faster. Yep. So probably it was faster than the mm -hmm. But I just asking in general. In general, it depends a lot on what type of external storage you use. Uh, if you buy a five dollar, you know, eight gig, you know, USB thumb drive, it oh, can yeah, be a one. lot slower than a installed app because the hard drive is considerably faster than USB 2.0. And when you have a thumb drive, it's not even USB 2.0 that is limiting your speed; yeah. it's the thumb drive itself limiting the speed. Yep. Your entire Debian, Debian mm -hmm. installs on a thumb drive, though, right? You can install Debian on a thumb drive, but to use it, you have to reboot your computer and make sure that your BIOS will let you boot from your thumb drive. And some administrators will lock down the BIOS, so you cannot do it. For good reasons, too. <laughs> yep. So this is only one type of software. If you look under other categories, you can find something that's also kind of interesting. Under Office, we already know what should be there already. Uh, you have. LibreOffice portable as you know the office suite, and it doesn't take up that much space because from some people would think you know, but isn't that going to take up a lot, a ton of space on my thumb drive? If you look at the installed size, and let's go all the way to the maximum, it takes about one gig installed, and that's with all the language packs. If you only require the English uh, language pack, um, it's only half a gig. Which is not a whole lot of storage these days, you know. With even with a thumb drive, um, I think you know the standard is what eight gigs now. Eight sixteen is the standard. Thirty two is slightly more expensive, like twenty four dollars, thirty at the most, for thirty two gig uh, thumb drive. So it's not really going to take up that much space. And then you have your application with you all at all times. You don't have to install it on the computer that you want to use it on. How many people can tell me whether the library has computers that have uh, either USB or SD slots? USB. Do they have USB exposed? Plenty. Okay. Well, then you can run it, you know, in the in the library, even yeah. though it's not installed in the library. You can still run it. They actually have like USB extensions hooked up to the USB ports on the back. So you can but it makes sense because you know they don't. We don't use floppy disks anymore, do we? <laughs> so how are we going to bring your files, you know, to the library and work <coughs> on your files, work on your documents, you know? But this way, you can not only bring your documents, you can also bring your applications pre-installed on the USB thumb drive. So that gives you a lot of flexibilities. Um, if you look under music and video for multimedia stuff, we have the usual, the standard Audacity. Audacity is an audio editor and recorder thing. It's really quite useful. Um, sorry? It's awesome. It's, it, the, the user interface looks really kind of awkward and old fashioned, but when you look at the functionality, it's really good. Um, if you have any type of LP, um, like vinyl, you know, um, uh, how do you call those things? 
appliance also? Discs. Discs, okay. Um, <laughs> those things, a big piece of plastic with a single track on it. Um, it's a single track, so if you want to you, uh, digitize, you know, it, it's, you, you replay the whole thing, it's one single track. So how do you, you break it up into songs? Well, Audacity makes it very easy. You can just you know, select you know, a bunch, and then you know, just say, I want this selection to be exported to MP3 or you know, any of the audio formats. You can also denoise your um, recording. Okay? In other words, let's say we have a certain type of recording, and the AC is running, you know, it's humming in the background, and, but it's a consistent kind of noise. So what you can do is you can record like you know maybe 15 seconds of silence, like me not talking and there's no other sound. And Audacity can sample the white noise and come up with a filter to just to filter out that noise. And then you can reapply that uh, count anti-noise filter on the entire recording. But it, has to, it only works well when the noise itself is consistent. It's just you know background hum, or the 60 hertz you know, electrical hum, or something like that, and it works exceptionally well for that type of noise. Question: uh, Multi-channel audio recording can also remove uh, lyrics. You can move vocals or the music. Yes, as well. if you want to be your you know, one band man, one man band, or one woman band, this is the tool to use because you can record one instrument first. And then what you can do with Audacity is you can play back one track or multiple tracks while recording the next track. So you can listen to your own track of piano while you add another track of violin. It's pretty useful for that. You can also time shift and make you know, all the beats you know, uh, meet, I mean, uh, make match, and so on and so forth. Uh, CD audio extraction and conversion, otherwise known as ripping. Okay, really useful. CD burning, you know, uh, infra recorder is my preference. You know, that's this is my uh, preferred recorder. I don't really burn DVDs, you know, these days. You know, so I don't really need anything that burns DVD. Uh, we have all kinds of media player. Of all of these. VLC is one of the most useful ones because it can replay just about any format that is not DRM. DRM stands for Digital Rights Management. Digital Right Management, which means you know they make sure that you have to purchase the license before you play the content of any type of media. They make sure the company that's hosting the file and then the record company gets paid. Yep. The artist gets like twenty cents. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, pretty much. When we talk about encryption, we'll talk about how DRM works. Yep. I'll tell you something funny about VLC. In Windows, it actually recognizes bit files as a playable format. For it recognizes people. what? Bit files. Bit? Bin. Bin. Yeah. As playable. Yeah. That I do not know. No, I mean, I'm, I, when I download a VLC, Windows actually assigns dot .bin mm -hmm. to VLC for some reason. And then we have music creation and notation, and video editor. Video uh, virtual dub is actually fairly useful too. <coughs> I'm kind of surprised that it doesn't have a LMMS listed here. LMMS, ironically, stands for Linux Music Multimedia Music System, or something along that line. And for those of you who like, you know, synthesize you know, music, you know, with synthesizer and the sequencer and stuff like that, the, the whole nine yard. This is basically a software uh, music studio. So for anyone who's interested in LMMS, you know, you can go ahead and check it out. There is a Windows version for it, but it's not in the portable apps here. Um, and then we have security, utilities, games, education. I personally like several, several of these programs too. Um, I like Stellarium. It turns your computer into a planetarium. Um, it's quite useful, especially if you like astronomy and you have a uh, you have not a microscope, a telescope. telescope. Okay, if you have a telescope of any kind, doesn't even have to be a telescope, even a good binocular, and you like to show somebody else, you know, how to look for stars or the constellations and stuff like that. This software allows you to control the time. So let's say you 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 can tell the software. I'm in Sacramento, and it's not just Sacramento, it actually differentiates between Sacramento and Citrus Heights and Carmichael, all the different locations, because the um, coordinates, the star coordinate will be off just a little bit. 
um, you can set the time. You can say, I want to see what I should be seeing in the, in, at night, tonight at 9 p.m. And you can point a, a certain direction, and it will show you exactly what you should be seeing at that time, at that location. Um, you can also zoom in. If you have a high power astronomy uh, telescope, you can actually use the software to zoom in to help you, you know, look at the surrounding star you know, configuration. So you can zoom in and you know, zero in to the star that you want to look at, or the nebula, or whatever you want to look at. Um, really quite useful. I have it pre-installed onto my ISO. I can show you what it looks like. Ah, okay. I don't have OpenGL oh. supported yet. What's OpenGL? Okay. OpenGL is um, is a library that will allow your computer to access the uh, functions of your graphics card. So I don't have that installed here. It's just a driver issue. The hardware can do it. I just don't have the driver driver installed. Um, Celestia is about the same thing, but it's a simulator instead of a planetarium. In other words. Stellarium says, you know, you are on Earth somewhere and you're looking at the night sky and I will show you what it looks like at a particular time at a certain location. Uh, Celestia allows you to travel through space. In other words, you can say, I want to go to Mars. Okay? So you type your destination as Mars and it will bring you to Mars and then you basically, how many people have watched the classic Star Trek? The TV series. Oh, okay, one, so it. it's almost like you're orbiting a planet, <laughs> and you can basically scroll. You know, use one of the mouse. I think it's the middle mouse. So when you use your middle mouse button and you move your mouse, um, it will scroll the planet in different directions. So you can you can zoom in using the zoom wheel uh, to look, take a closer look at a planet or a moon or something like that. How distant? Hmm? Do you know how distant it was? Like what distance? It can oh, go to anywhere, you know, anything in the database. So even if it is light years away or hundreds or thousands of light years away, as long as the database has it, it can bring you to the, uh, to the object that you want to observe. But in order to use the rotation feature, you have, you know, it has to have a 3D map of the, of the entire thing. So that means you know, with certain types of nebula and other really distant objects, you, know, you cannot rotate around it because we can only we have only seen it from one side. We you know, we we don't have probes, you know, that have taken pictures around it yet. But it's still fun, you know, for especially for kids, you know, who want to get into astronomy, physics, and science. You know, this is really cool. Um, a lot of this, you know, I have not even used. You know, any other question? Any questions about portable apps? No. I just uh, asked them uh, how like. Do you know like the difference between the, those two programs and like in Google or Do you know how like it differs? The two programs, those two under astronomy? The first two under yeah. astronomy? Do you know how like it differs from Google Earth? You know, have you used them both? I have not used Google Earth, uh, but I okay, can Google Earth go to other planets? So maybe they have about the same you know. See, yeah, see what you're saying is uh, I just want to like know which one's better, so you know. I thought you used both. So I think they're different. Um, Celestia is intended for like true astronomy, so you can actually go to nebula and you know, galaxies and the. Uh, so whatever the you know, we have a database of a picture of, you know, you can go there. Can Google Earth go there too? Yes, if you install the um, uh, pack up. Okay. And so probably has about the same feature. Then. Yes, and also when you like the like. We were talking about like the Earth stars and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like they have a portable app, no, not for a mobile app for Google. It's still called in Google Sky. Okay. You basically like have your camera. And no, right. And then yeah, you I've used that. Yeah, yeah, that's actually pretty cool. Um, what he's talking about um, with Google Sky is it's an app you can install on your smartphone or a tablet, and it links into the compass and also the accelerometer of your phone. So if you just kind of hold it out like this, it knows where it is pointing at, and it knows the angle, it knows the time. It using GPS, it also knows your location, and it will just project on your um, screen, you know, what what type of star you should be looking at, and the names of the star, the constellations, and stuff like that. So it's pretty handy. Um, Stellarium is a little bit more intended for laptop computers. Um, so the interface is definitely more refined. And the database, I think, is 
pretty extensive. I know Google is always live. You know, it's, it, the database has to be huge. But if you are, you know, to set up a telescope and you really want to know, you know, how do I zoom into a particular star, uh, that will give you a lot more finer control compared to your phone. Because when when you use a phone like this, if your hand just shakes a little bit, <laughs> using a astronomy telescope, that's off by a whole lot. So for you know, for that type of application, Stellarium is still a little bit better. But from what you described, Google Earth can do what Celestia can do. So they overlap a lot. Let's take a look at security, because I think you know, that's also an important topic. So we have you know, all this software. Now this one is a freeware, not open source, which means um, the licensing is different. You do not have access to the source code, yet, and you may not have permission to change the source code either. So we have a ClamWin Portable, which is an antivirus or software. From the reviews that I have seen so far, Clam is not really that good compared to the other antivirus software. So in a pinch, you can use it. Um, like you try to use a system that has no um, virus scanner installed already, and you are downloading a file, you kind of don't know what, whether the file is clean or not. In a pinch, I would use you know, ClamWin to do it, but there are better products for Windows that can do virus scanning. So I wouldn't use it as the only software. Now this is interesting. Password safe, you know, password managers. And this opens up a big, huge can of worm. Now how many people have too many accounts and too many passwords to remember? Two hands, okay. <clears throat> so what are you going to do? Write it on <laughs> now, when you go to Fry's, go to their stationery section, you can actually buy little notebook computers. I mean, little notebooks, physical physical notebooks, and you can use it to record the website, your username, and your password. And the little notebook itself says, you know, password manager or something like that. Now, I think that's not a very that's it's not a very smart idea to label it, you know, as a password manager. Okay. <laughs> You might want to label as shopping list or you know something that is kind Definitely of more. Definitely not a password manager. Something more yeah, like not a password manager. Do not look wrong. here. Nothing secret, right? No something secrets in more here. Not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but even so, you know, is it a good idea to put it on paper? No, because paper is better than a password. It's better than a password manager. Very good. What happens when I use a password manager on a smartphone? Because it is so handy, right? You know, I use it for everything, and I can just look up my password. Sure. What is the danger of this? Somebody can just look inside of it and get all your passwords. Exactly, so and someone can. Yep, and that person doesn't even have to follow me to pick up my actual physical note notepad that has the passwords. Someone can do it, you know, halfway around the globe. Yep. Well, the even better one is what if you forget the password to your password manager? Then you ask a hacker to help you <laughs> recover your password <laughs> because they know how to do it. You do. You may not remember, but they know how to do it. Um, but even with a password manager, paper-based, I would not recommend writing down both your username and your password. Most websites, including Moodle, allow you to reset your password. You know, once once you register, you know it knows your email address, so you can just you know, say, "I want to reset my password." It will send you a first email to ask, did you ask for a new password? Because somebody could have to tried to you know, play a trick on you and say, okay, let's go reset his password, right? So if you didn't request a password, you don't have to click the link and nothing changes. But let's say you did ask for a new password, you click that link, it confirmed with the system, confirms with the system that you wanted a new password, then it will send you a second email with a temporary password, probably with a certain expiration time, then you can use that to log into your system and then change your password back to whatever it was. In other words, you don't really need to remember the passwords all the time. You just need to remember two things. One, where is the website? Two, what is your username? Once you have the website and the username and assuming you registered correctly, you can always reset your password at any time. So I would not write down the pass I would not write down the password next to the username at all. Maybe a hint, okay? Maybe you use you know, your cars as passwords. So instead of writing down the exact you know car and the exact password, you just say you know car when I graduated from high school. Okay, so only you know what the answer is. 
or your closest friends may know the answer too, but you know, it kind of limits, you know, if a stranger picks up your notepad, chances are that person will not be able to guess your password. Unless you have a really common, you know, kind of car when you graduated from high school. Or if it's the only car you ever bought. Hmm? Or, or if it's the only car you ever bought. Or you don't use any type of, or, you, or if you just spell out the name of the car without any, you know, t special type of, you know, ca special characters. Or you just use Facebook so much that you decide to put all that information out there for the public. <laughs> <laughs> and people are starting to do that. Okay, amazingly, people are starting to do that. And that really brings up, you know, something that I think is fun. Is um, It's an anime, Japanese anime, called uh, Summer Wars. Okay, that's it. And if you go to Wikipedia, it gives you a, an idea of what it is. Um, a certain description. It's a Japanese anime, probably intended for 13 to 16 year olds. Um, but if you look at the plot, the story plot, it's actually you know not too far out. Okay, I would say you know it can happen, just not as dramatic as they put it. Okay, um, if you look at the picture, let me let me see if I can get a bigger version of this picture. No. Nope. I can get a smaller version, yeah. but not a bigger version. <laughs> can zoom in. No, that would just pixelate, right? Or I can use here, summer wars, images. Yeah. And nope, that's a small one. Nope, doesn't have any. Anyway, I can just give you a, a short summary of the plot line. It's basically based on the assumption that we were just talking about. You know, people were using Facebook and other social media, and they were storing the passwords of, let's say, the workplace, their you know other type of accounts, you know, on online, or even using you know these uh, cell phones, you know, with an electronic you know password manager. So the story goes like, you know, what what if there's an AI, a, a, a artificial intelligence? Um, that was designed and programmed to hack, and it was running wild, and it hacked into these websites. So now, suddenly, instead of just being able to get into other people's Facebook, now they can get into many other systems because you know, it now has the passwords to authenticate to other systems. And in this story, you know, they talk about how you know traffic controllers, you know, store their passwords, you know, using the social media. So now the computer, the AI, also has access to guess what? Traffic control, satellite orbit control. <laughs> uh, and that's why you see in the background here, see this little shooting star? It's not a shooting star, it's a satellite. And the computer the, uh, tell, told the satellite to change orbit to basically kill this bunch of people. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Not very nice. Not very nice, but, but that's because these people were trying to stop the AI. So the AI decided, hey, instead of beating you online, I'll just physically beat you. <laughs> yeah, beat that. Yep. So it's, a, it's an interesting movie. Um, it's, it was released in 2009, not 2013. But I think what it's, uh, the, the content of the movie, if you focus on the technology and also the, the actual sci-fi side, and it's actually plausible that a computer, you know, some a hacker or hacker group can potentially gain access to a lot of stuff just by hacking into your know, Facebook or your cell phone, you know, where passwords are stored. Any questions, comments about this anime? Has anyone seen it? Other than my uh, No? Okay. It's, it's, a it's a pretty good one. Um, it's done by the same people who, um, who um, animated uh, Digimon. So it has you know the same kind of uh, you know animation in certain parts. So certain parts are definitely intended for you know thirteen year olds, you know middle schoolers. Uh, but other parts, you know, it's actually pretty good as a sci-fi. I would, I would say this is one of the the real sci-fis. Right. One thing about uh, Facebook security is some people even like they'll put oh I'm out of town at this place or this time, and then people 
sometimes they get their houses breaking in, broken into because uh, people who. But you never know whether it is an actual, you know, careless, you know, homeowner or an FBI agent, you know, pretending to be one. Yeah. Uh, they, Nine times out of a hundred, it's probably going to be the uh, first one, though. <laughs> the first case. Yeah. Because uh, I, I have uh, read articles about how the FBI, you know, have people who, to go into Facebook, mm -hmm. you know, posing as, you know, attractive, you know, people. Yeah. And they will send, you know, you know let, let's be friends, you know, you know, friend me or, you know, add me to your list, you know, to uh, people that they know are criminals, but they do not have evidence yet <coughs> to indict those people. Nothing wrong with testing the water. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with testing the water. Nope. <laughs> And a lot of times they actually would succeed in gathering enough evidence online, you know, because these, you know, these criminals just could not stop spewing out their, you know, uh, accomplishments, let's and say. like the people in, I think it was Texas, that right after they robbed the bank, they uh, Texas. Facebooked about it, or tweeted about it, one of the two. Yeah, they were like, we just robbed the bank, oh, well, something like that. They should have died, done the live cam thing too. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's like well, right. as it happens, right? Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on their profile. Yeah. Here's the cross streets that we're driving. Over. And here's a here's a here's a Secret link to I follow me. Yeah. <laughs> Click. <laughs> follow me. Here's my GPS location. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Facebook statements. Tweeting too. Because if you had like a stalker follow you, you know, you just got Facebook stalked. Well, since we're talking about security, let's go ahead and switch gear a little bit and talk about computer security. Just, just a little bit. Just something that I have, you know, uh, thought about lately. Um, how many people in this class understand what a browser cookie is? Okay, a few. Okay, so I, I would explain that. All right. To explain that part, I, first of all, I have to explain what a, a TCP/IP connection is. It sounds really technical, but it's not. Um, when you t click a link, okay, I'll use an example. I go to say Amazon.com, and you know I have not signed in yet, but I don't even have to sign in to show you what you know why we need cookies. So if I look for certain things, let's say I look for, um, okay, I look for a Blaze extended battery. So we'll go for. In here, and I'll add to my cart. Okay, I haven't signed in yet, but yet you know uh, Amazon can keep track of my shopping cart. Now, right here, I'll stop because how can Amazon keep track of you know me having put an item in the shopping cart? Now okay. that is amazing because every time I click something, okay, doesn't matter what I click. You know, if I click you know something else and I say oh, I want to get a hot pink USB power adapter <laughs> because I tend to lose them. Because I tend to lose them, not because I like the color. <laughs> the hot pink ones you tend to lose? <laughs> <laughs> Good one. They're easier to find. Easier to find. They're easy to find and it's un unlikely to be stolen too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now the question is, if I click this add to cart, how can it track that now I have two items in a shopping cart? Now, it might th it, now people who use websites, you know, will think, but that's the way it is, right? I mean, it's just you know, easy. It's not quite that easy because every time you click something, if I want to co uh, finish my collection of hot pink stuff and want to get a hot pink, you know, car adapter, <laughs> <laughs> okay. because he loses those as well. Yes, because I tend to lose those too, and you know. Yeah. <laughs> so the qu the thing is, when I click this link here, it is an entirely different connection from this computer to the Amazon.com computer. In other words, it's not a quote unquote ongoing conversation between these two computers. Every time you click something, it's like you know giving somebody a, a call, um, starting from scratch. In other words, it is not quote unquote natural that Amazon.com can keep track of the shopping cart. The only reason why it can do that has to do with cookies. A cookie is basically a little bit of information stored on this side of this, of this computer. Look at it as a little token, okay, a little token. So the first time I go to the Amazon website, the Amazon.com website will ask this computer 
to say, can you store a little bit of information? It's called a cookie. It's basically a token. In this computer, unless I turn off cookies, it will say, yeah, sure, I'll store a cookie. All right. But the, the, the property of a cookie is every time I go back to Amazon, this computer will voluntarily transmit that cookie along with the request to buy whatever I want. So that cookie is my identification. It's ident it identifies my shopping session in this case. Okay? And that's how it can connect you know, the items that I've put in my shopping cart with the next, with the next click that I put on this website. Okay? Without a cookie, it would not be able to track you know, what, what my shopping cart is because every click is like starting from scratch. Are we doing okay so far with the concept of a cookie? It's an identifi identifier to say that, yes, all future clicks from this browser is the same session. Can other websites like Google also track like what you browsed on other sites like Amazon? And Good eBay question. And okay, we are, we're, getting, we're getting there, okay? So there are two types of cookies, two main types. One is called a regular cookie, which where you know Amazon.com gave me a cookie, and my browser retransmits the same cookie, but only to Amazon.com. Okay, that's called a, a regular cookie, which means that cookie or that little token will not be transmitted to say Google. It will not be transmitted to say Weather.com or cbs.com or any of the other websites, it will only be retransmitted to amazon.com. But there's also a concept called a third party cookie. A third party cookie is different because you know, it can retransmit to any website. Okay? Now that can be dangerous because you know, amazon.com or some website can give you a third party cookie, but it will retransmit that third party cookie to websites other than Amazon.com. Okay? Now fortunately, most browsers have third-party cookies already turned off by default because it is such a security risk. You go to the, um, the branch settings, and then you go to settings, and then you go to uh, show advanced feature, content settings, I can't remember how to find it. I believe it is under content settings for Chrome. Is it? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay, right there. Ah, so it has not been blocked yet. So I should have clicked this one because that's what the you know, third party cookies are. Is you know it allows one website to give you the cookie and then you know it will retransmit that cookie to websites other than that one single party. So that's the first thing you want to turn off. Let's say you turn that off. Are you safe? You know, can different companies track your you know browsing habit the answer is absolutely yes okay let me tell let me show you why they can do it this is really quite annoying because most people don't know about it and their browsing habit is getting tracked uh, this way so this way uh, this time I'll go to weather.com you know since simple enough I just want to check the local weather okay fine and I scroll down and you will see Okay, this, here's an advertisement right here, and it doesn't, okay, it doesn't show. Now, whenever you see <laughs> an advertisement, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and it is, here's another one, and if you scroll down, there's a whole bunch of ads, stuff like this, okay? The question is, how many cookies am I getting just by going to weather.com without clicking anything else? I'm not even clicking the ads. The answer is as many as there are images. Because every time your web page calls for an image, any type of resource, it can be a media file, it can be an image, just like this one here, responding by storm. Why would anyone name their car storm? That's beyond me. Responding by storm. If you look at that image, it looks really innocent, right? But when the browser wants to download and display that image, it can also set a cookie because it is yet another connection to another website. But that's not weather.com. That image comes from somewhere else. So the other website, which is probably doubleclick.com, you know, one of the online advertisement companies, that company can now set a cookie on this particular computer. It may not be a third party cookie, which means it will only send itself back to doubleclick.com. 
Okay, so it may not seem very harmful. You know, how can they track my browsing habit this way? Well, let me go to another website. So let's say I want to check the news now. I want to go to CBS.com, whatever you know, news station you want to go to. Doesn't matter. And you see a bunch of ads too, right? There's an ad here on the banner. Um, and down. And now that's not a whole lot of ads. It's actually less than what I expected. But then, but there, there, there are ads. There's an ad footer too. I hate this. Hmm? The, the banner that follows your oh yeah I hate that. yeah but but there is an ad at the, at the top here if this ad is put up here by the same company which is let's say doubleclick.com or double uh, doubleclick.net mm -hmm. now it knows now the cookie that I set earlier will now be retransmitted back to doubleclick when I try to get that image so from doubleclick's perspective it can now kind of start to keep track of my browsing habit. Can do it. And now this is not the worst. The worst part is what if you can sign in to a particular website? Now they know they not only know your IP address and your browsing habit, they can now link you or your browsing habit to a a, a particular account. Yep. Starting to even worse with like well I don't think Google is necessarily a bad company. I'm going to preface this, but with location services, now they're starting to tailor ads not only to just what your browsing habits are, but what's local to you. Mm -hmm. So yeah. these companies actually have access to your, because location services uses GPS. They actually yep. have access to where you live on a longitude latitude basis. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want the ads you know, to display because it's annoying and distracting, and you want to stop you know, all these other things that can go along with the advertisements, I use ad block you know, to do it. Um, it's very configurable. In other words, you know, if you really want to spend the time, you can allow certain types of ads to go through because that's what you want, and then you can block the rest, depending on which website you're going and a lot of other things too. Um, it's not a bad product. I really like it. Um, it's just that when you install this and you go to Hulu, Hulu will say, well, since I cannot display any ads, I'll give you silence for a minute to punish you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even go to Hulu anymore, so it's, non it's a non-issue now. You get tired of the cold shoulder? No! I, I would just say, hey, here's my opportunity to grade a few more homework assignments. <laughs> oh, the show starts again. Okay. Watch the show. <laughs> Love your priorities. The, sh the show. Got to set the priorities straight. <laughs> She'll take precedence over me. But that's how they can track you. Okay, they can track you not only your browsing habit at Amazon <coughs> and you know other websites. They can track you everywhere. Yep. Do they have anything like this for Firefox? Yeah, AdBlock. You know, originally came from Firefox as a as a as an extension. Um, Chrome got it later on, um, but now they're, it's available for both Chrome and also Firefox. And now, so that's yeah. for Google. Uh, I've noticed my brother uses Chrome. I use Firefox. Uh, Chrome's ad block doesn't block YouTube ads. Ah. Uh, like like maybe allowed, it's um, sponsored by Google. Shut off it is. Well, that's hey, the whole thing because you know because Chrome is a oh, Google product. Chrome, yeah. So they can circumvent you know certain things that an add-on will try to yeah. try to do. Yeah. There, that's that's another reason why you should use Firefox sometimes. Yep. Yep. Then also on Chrome, you could get uh, this one ad block for YouTube. It's called YouTube Screw, mm -hmm. and you can actually get them blocked. And also, ad block is now on Safari too. On Safari too. Mm -hmm. That's good. Because I have it on my. All right. So that's something that you, we should keep an eye on. You know, is basically your privacy. Now, what if? Now remember, your ISP, your internet service provider, actually has a legal obligation to monitor and log your internet traffic. Okay, what does that mean? That means you know, as long as nothing happens, you know, nobody's going to look dig up your you know browsing habit, you know, what you search for from in Google and other you know search engines. But in case you know there's a a probable plausible cause you know to look into your browsing habit someone can go to the court and or can get and uh, get a um, court order it's, yeah. I'm not yeah, yeah they have a they need a court order in order to do this and they have they can go to your ISP and request a log 
corresponding to your, I, to your IP address for whatever duration they need to look into. Okay? But they need to go through the court. You know, so the police department cannot just say, oh, we, don't, we, want, we need to look into your, your internet browsing habit and go to the ISP and, and demand the list. They need to have the court to issue the court order. And that's part of the, uh, the uh, balancing of power between the three branches yeah. of the government, so that you know, one single branch cannot have all the power. So the court can decide and say, there's no probable cause. I don't think this guy is, you know, there's any reason to look, to dig up his you know, browsing habit. And then the police department cannot do it. Yep. Um, but your ISP provider, uh, like Comcast, mm -hmm. can also send you a nice little email if you've been doing, uh, say, like downloading from torrents, downloading music, you know, from P2P. Mm -hmm. They can also send you a nice little email saying, you're not allowed to do this. This is against the laws. So, uh, privacy uh, laws for mm -hmm. copyright or whatever. Yep. Give you a nice little warning if you do it again, no problem. Well, now of course, from, from Comcast perspective, it's because you're using too much of that bandwidth. <laughs> they want you to stop, you know, all those, you know, other letters that tells you, you know, you've been using too much bandwidth. I'll throttle you down, and you just ignore that, right? But a court order, potential court order, it's like, okay, I'll stop. <laughs> but if you try to serve up anything that has a lot of gigabytes, and yet it is still open, it's open source or it is legal, they will still send you a note. They will just send you a different note because they want you to stop using all that bandwidth. <laughs> like distributing my uh, Debian ISO is 1.5 gigabytes and it's open source, it's completely legal. Um, so if you try to put it up you know, through peer to peer, I'm sure Comcast will <laughs> knock on your door again. It's like, okay, you know, you have to stop this. <laughs> Any other questions? I know the school doesn't let you download any torrents here at all. Or I think they block, you know, torrents. Yeah, because yeah. I was trying to, like, download this one book from a torrent site, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't let me do anything. Well, let's see if that's uh, also part of the portable app thing. Did anyone notice uh, portable apps have uh, any torrent issue, uh, torrent software? Oh, we we'll search. G torrent. Yep, yeah, micro torrent. Okay, how many people do not know what is torrent? <laughs> okay, torrent is. Okay, torrent is a peer-to-peer -peer software. You know, it used to be something else, but torrent is now the leading standard of peer-to-peer. Peer-to-peer -peer means you know you can share a file with other people on the internet. Now the file that you're sharing can be legit, can be illegal. It doesn't matter. It's just a mechanism to make file sharing effective and very efficient. So when you install you know a, a torrent client program, which also acts as a server, now you can say you know oh I got this file I can share with other people. And the whole thing about torrent, you know why it is so e efficient and also robust, has to do with this. This is your computer on the internet. It's really small. I intentionally make it a very small thing. So let's say we have all of these other people who also want to download and install and uh, use the Debian ISO uh, image, which is 1.6 gigabytes. That's a lot. So conventionally, they all have to come to your computer, and your computer will have to make connections to each one of these computers, and each connection will take up your know, 1.6 gigabytes of quote-unquote bandwidth or network traffic. So together, it uses up a lot of bandwidth. And that's why uh, Comcast will complain and say, hey, you're not supposed to use up all, all that bandwidth. Even though it is completely legitimate, in this case, it's open source software, it's an ISO. It's not copyrighted you know, in the conventional sense. It's open source, <coughs> you can redistribute it as you, know, as you see fit. So this is not efficient. So what people do with torrent is something that more like this. Your computer is still the quote unquote seed, the original seed, S-E-E-D seed of the file because you're the originator of the file. But let's say you, know, you have a really fast connection to this computer and you transmit 1.6, well let's say even half of that. Okay? That's the beauty of torrent is you can, you can upload half here and then let's say half here. Because these two were subscribing to your Twitter and they got your tweet and say, oh, I got a new ISO image, you know, okay, we're jumping on it, we're downloading it. 
and each one is only downloading, let's say, half a gig. So what happens is, once this guy, you know, once this computer has you know, that half gig, and this computer have that half gig, Torrent can talk to all the peers. So these two guys will start to know each other. And now they can exchange. And this computer can say, oh, I got half of it. What, what have you got? I got the other half. <laughs> Great. <laughs> OK, let's share. So now your, your file, which is 1.6 gigabytes, will now be on both of these computers. Now you have three seats on, in the entire network. OK, when all the other computers ask for that file, Torrent will automatically look for the quote unquote closest you know, um, friend or closest you know, peer. So this guy being close to here will say, I will serve you, I will also serve you. <laughs> and then this guy will say, I will serve you. And then once this guy has all the files, it can now serve this one, serve this one, this one, and this one over here. And it can, it's very robust. You can take down multiple of these computers and the file sharing cannot stop just because you take down a few of those. <coughs> And it's very efficient because you know, once you have several computers close to your quote unquote network neighborhood, then you can just get the file or fragments of the file from those you know, several ones. Okay. Is that kind of making any sense? Yeah. Okay. So it's a very efficient way of sharing files. And torrent by itself is not illegal. Okay? As much as you know, the media companies want us to believe, torrent is not illegal. It is the sharing of copyrighted material that is illegal. So you can use Torrent to share things that is legitimate. It's perfectly fine. It's perfectly legal. Um, are there any questions about this? That's a good spot to go. <laughs> <coughs> well, it's it's an interesting thing because um, you know, five years from you know, five years ago, you know this would not have been a, a topic at all. Um, they had file sharing before, but this is, Torrent made it viral, basically. It just, they, it, it just makes everything easy. And cop copyrighted material can be um, shared this way very effectively. And that's why media companies have you know, major complaints of, against you know, file sharing or anyone that supports your know, file sharing. There are companies or websites out there who indexed um, torrents. In other words, you know, your computer has this particular ISO, the Debian Live ISO that you want to share, but you want to expose it to the entire internet because you think this is so great, I want to share this with the, with the entire world. How do you do it? Well, there are index websites out there that can say, okay, if you have a torrent, we'll just, you know, just we'll put an entry, index entry to your torrent so that other people can search and find whatever you have to share. And a lot, unfortunately, a lot of people you know, post illegal content, copyrighted content, on those websites, so that people who want to download you know, something illegal would go. Go ahead. Oh, I thought you had a point. Okay. So they, they they start to shut down these websites. Now the name of some of these websites did not help. Like Pirate Bay, really did not help. <laughs> That's been shut down. Hmm? That's been shut down. That's been shut down. Still running that's a now. that's a long history of Pirate Bay because um, it's still illegal works. in it certain works. countries. It still works because still it's works. Uh, it's hosted in some countries where you know they do not <coughs> consider this illegal. Yeah, my friend <coughs> told me about that works. Now, which country had a political party called the Pirate Party? Yes. I'm not kidding. There's one country that has a Pirate Party. Is it the Is Netherlands? It Sweden. Sweden. I think it was Sweden. Sweden? Sweden. Yeah, it's probably Sweden. It's up north, right? They, they, um, they voted they the this. guy to be a mayor, I think, of the city. <laughs> or the, the pirate party guy. Okay, the pirate party. <laughs> and a it's, pirate a, it's, party. A, it's a political party. It's not you know, just a movement of you know, sharing pirated content. It's an actually a political party. It's not even a real party. It's a label adopted by political parties in different countries. I like the flag. Nice. <laughs> Support civil rights, direct democracy, and participation, and some other people see it as you know anarchy. Swedish. <laughs> okay, there you go. Like you tell you in Russia, they have view party. So <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, but it's it's kind of interesting how 
But it's interesting <laughs> how different countries will look at you know privacy, democracy in different ways, basically different interpretation, um, and po impose different limits you know on those you know, different ideas too. Yeah, I love Swedish. <laughs> well, they they got Angry Birds <laughs> and ABBA Good ideas. What? and Volvo. Yeah, Volvo is kind of down on the list. You know, that's the the third largest export <laughs> after you know ABBA, and ABBA is after Angry Birds. Largest. Export. Did you guys know the Angry Birds came from Sweden? Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. I think you told us about this yeah. last week. But yeah. Yeah. Pretty interesting. Yeah, and ABBA. Don't yeah. forget ABBA. <laughs> it's very retro. <laughs> to you guys, it's retro. To some of us, it's like, yeah, but I grew up with that. Okay. <laughs> any other questions about this sort of thing? Well, since we are on the road here, let's go take a look at the DRM, digital right management, and along with that, several other things like DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And also, what is the other one? Trusted computing, that's a big one. All right, so let's take a look at these things, you know, because I think you know, this is actually on the syllabus. We have to talk about this stuff eventually. Let's look at it out of the way. Hmm? Digital right management is a class of access control technologies. Yeah. So this is not a law, it is basically a technology that allows you <coughs> that allows media company, not you, has nothing to do with you, it has to do with the media companies, people who distribute content, to make sure that people cannot get an illegal copy of a file and play it, okay? So the way it works, you know, in a nutshell, is basically it says, you know, if you try to download a file from a particular computer, let's say it's a media file, you know, okay, it can be music, can be video, can be what, whatever. That file is only playable on the computer that you order the file from. In other words, you can make copies of that file, give it to your friends, but your friend's player would not be able to play that file. That's the basic technology behind DRM. Doesn't that only work for like digital technology? Sorry? Doesn't that only work for digital technology, like technology that's only copied onto the hard drive? Correct, yes. Um, but even if you get the file because it's encrypted, and the decryption key is specific to your processor. So that means if you give that file to somebody else, they could they will not be able to decrypt the content and play the content. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why when you change computer, you have to go to the content provider and say, well, I really honestly changed my computer and I would like to, you know, have access to this media content again. If they are convinced, they can let you do it. If they're not convinced, you know, you have to buy the content again. Okay. Yep. Apple's crazy about that. Yeah. Apple? Yeah. Well, like, if you say, like, for instance, I have two iPhones and mm -hmm. then I have three computers. Yeah. Well, like, if I ever replace one of those five devices, I have to deauthorize every single device attached to my iTunes account because you're only allowed five devices. Oh. Uh, okay. So you can't deauthorize individual devices. So if you meet your cat, mm -hmm. you can deauthorize them all, but you can only do that so many times per year. But but new, a new iPad is coming up every six months, and yeah. a new so like iPod. I reached my when I got when my girlfriend got an iPhone, I reached my cat, and I so mad because I had to go in, deauthorize them all, start up every computer and device, and reauthorize every single one of them to use the content. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very troublesome, even though you are the legitimate even owner of all the stuff. You still have to go through the trouble to do it. Even like the iTunes stuff where they say it's DRM free and they make you pay $1.29 per song, yeah. it's actually not DRM free. Like, really? If it goes to another computer, mm -hmm. if it was downloaded using your account, you can't play it. Uh, so that's not DR, that, that is not DRM free. DRM free means like you download yeah. the song, you the put it The good old MP3, right? Yeah. yeah. Amazon does. Yeah, Amazon files are all DRM free, as in, you know, really free. You can put it onto any player and it will just play correctly. Yep. But this also brings us to another kind of technology uh, issue. It has been pushed by the Trusted Computing Group, which we'll talk about later. Maybe not today, but some other time. It has to do with, well, it's no big deal because I'll just attach, you know, a little you know, thing to the, uh, to the 
earplug, and I will just you know, feed that to another computer, redigitize you know the content into a you know, open file, then I have an un DRM version of that. It is probably illegal or gray, but as long as you're not sharing that with other people and just put it onto the seven devices that you have, you know, hey, you know, the media company should not care. If you if you read the DMCA, which is what the DR DRM is based on. It's a technology to, to support the DMCA, yeah. right. So like, the DMCA is very vague yes. on a lot of things. Like, yes. if you're not redistributing with the intent to sell, technically it doesn't follow the, fall under the DMCA yeah, right. at all. So, it's yeah, but, but since you know, they have many more lawyers than you do, yeah, yeah. so if they really want to <laughs> nail you, they can <laughs> nail you. <laughs> yep. Okay, but even that is going away because you know you, you, if you think about computer speakers, you know the audio jacks on the back of your computer, those are all quote unquote analog technology. Okay, you can just you know take the output of your um, earphone output, plug it to another computer's you know microphone, and then just re-record everything that you play on this computer. And if you re-record at you know 44 kilohertz, you know 16 bit, you can still get fairly good quality, you know, resulting you know thing. You have some loss of quality because of the cable, the encoding and the decoding, but you can still get something decent. The um, companies are trying to stop that by making sure that you cannot have analog audio and video devices. Well, can't you just use like a digital recorder? A digital recorder? Yeah. Like you know, right now you're doing screen recording, right? Right. But you can also just get one just for sound recording on your computer. So as long as you're playing it back on your computer, you can. But who says you can install out. that software on your system? Who says you can? <laughs> because the because trusted computer is going in that direction. In other words, they can't stop you from using open source programs. Yes, they can. They can. What they do, what they're doing, what they're trying to do yeah, for many years, what yeah, they're trying to make it really locked down. Yeah, they want to lock down your computer. In other words, you know, they, they, Microsoft, Intel, and many other companies are trying to work together so that you know, the installer of whatever you want to install in your system will tell the operating system whether the, installing so the installed software is coming from a member of the trusted group of companies. Okay? If it is open source, it's clearly not going to be in a trusted group. So they will let you do it, but it will quote unquote taint the state of your system so that your computer will be flagged as not trusted anymore. Now if your computer, your operating system is saying that I'm not trusted and you try to download a file from you know, iTunes or whatever, um, the other company, the media companies that is actually supplying the content can say I refuse to do business with you because you have installed a program that is not coming from a company of this trusted uh, group of companies and now you're kind of, you, know, you still have your computer, you can do whatever you want with your computer, but nobody wants to do business with you. The people just pirate. Yeah. That it's just, it just pushes people to you know, just plain old you know, pirating because you know, this is just so much hassle for the average user to do anything. Well, like, that's a good point. If you look at like, <coughs> the little informatic out there on the, mm -hmm. the, the torrent. Uh, yeah. yeah. If you look at how like torrenting works, like, that's the reason why they can't stop it because it's exponential growth. They cannot stop it with technology, so they sue people. Yeah. They sue people for money amount that is un insane. You know, for individuals, they're suing people for millions of dollars, you know, as a fine. But the law clearly states that you know, it cannot be punitive when you find somebody. You, it, it can only be you know, up to a certain amount. You cannot do it to set an example for, example for others. And yet, you know, guess what the RIA and the MPA are doing? Do exactly that. They're using a huge amount of money to set examples to scare everybody else from doing the same thing. So there are a lot of you know st stuff going on that most people do not know because you know, do, do you think CBS or ABC or even BBC will put this as a headline and say so and so got fined for you know two point six million dollars and yeah you know, this is not constitutional? Would that ever make it to the headline? Hmm? You know, if you guys run the website, you know that would be you know. But since you're not running a website, you know that's not going to happen. And there are, there's another movement to stop people from running websites altogether. Think about TV broadcasting in the, in the good old days, okay? So each one of us who own a website is basically running a 
quote unquote broadcasting company or broadcasting station. So there are companies who are trying to stop that and say, no, we'll regulate websites just like the way we regulate TV broadcasting. If you don't have a license from a certain you know, government agency, you cannot own, operate a website. You cannot disclose and share content with the rest of the world. And that movement does not come from China. <laughs> <laughs> Let me make that very clear. <laughs> I think it's funny, like a lot of their things is, we got to stop things like pornography on the internet and stuff like that. Well, pornography is a very good excuse. Yeah. Okay, you know, that and many other things, you know, can be used as excuses. I mean, it's 86% of the web pages online. 86% <laughs> <laughs> of the web pages online today are pornographic websites. Only a very small percentage of the web is is actually stuff that you that can modern. Yeah, stuff like Google and things like that. So like, there would be no internet without pornography. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not trying to be funny, but like, there would there's would not be the infrastructure that was put in place is because of sites like pornographic websites. And they have their own lawyers to protect their yeah. copyrights too. So it's just you know business versus business. But it's a good excuse to you know convince you know voters to vote for certain things so that you know companies who really want to limit you know what we can do on the internet can do so. I would be interested to see how that argument fares against how long the eighteen to twenty five year old males voters <laughs> <laughs> and, and try to get rid of pornography on the web. I really it depends. <laughs> depends on how they you know, cast it. <laughs> it's all politics. I'll see you guys on next Tuesday. Stay safe on the internet. <laughs> okay, so like